So you loaded your project in an emulator. Uh, we looked at it in the uh, in the web browser as well. Ultimately, what we want to do is to be able to run it on a real device. Your real device may not work right now, so don't try this. But eventually, what we'll be able to do is type the right command, of course. And then what will happen is that on a on a real device, you see the one I've got right up here, it processed it in 1.9 seconds instead of six minutes like last time. It's then doing launch, and there it is. So that project that we're working on right there goes on a real device. This is a real Nexus 6 or 9 or something. And uh, it's installed for real in the apps, just like every other app right there. Hello Cordova. That's it. It doesn't do anything special yet. It just is device ready. Um, one thing that is kind of special is if I'm looking at it here and then I do this rotate, it does rotate to kind of uh, be on a nice screen orientation like that or like that. We can do that on the virtual devices also. And here in the browser I can hit that rotate icon. Um, landscape default and it's landscape. But obviously on a real device you actually see the animation and all of that. So if you can test on a real device, that's the best. I'll show you how to do this, of course. Starting next time, if you would like to check out one of these tablets, which is already set up for you to use in this lab, we'll be able to check them out. If you've got your own and you want to use your own device, you have to hold on a moment because we need to set up our device to be able to interface with the computer. We'll do that together. I'll have a handout and all of that. And you'll be able to do it at home or here. But to start to look at what we, what I just barely showed the tip of the iceberg, if you go back to the folder, uh, and I'm going to open one more time to look at it a little bit more in detail, like index HTML file in Notepad. Um, when you open it in Notepad, it's HTML. It's not that complex, less than 50 lines. If I were to run in Firefox or Chrome or wherever. I'm going to go with Chrome. If I were to launch it from Notepad, it won't work. It's not an HTML project anymore. It's a piece of an app. This is going to stay on connecting device forever. You saw over here, when I ran it the proper way, device is ready. So simply running from Notepad is not going to give us our result anymore. Even if I switch to developer mode, even if I turn on a device, even if I reload it, it's not running as a real app. It's running as a website. It's no longer a website. We've upgraded it. So one thing we need to get used to is, yeah, it's all still plain HTML languages, but it's not a website anymore. You can't double-click it to view it in the web browser anymore. You can't run it from Notepad anymore. Uh, it's not going to be that helpful to run it in brackets or Sublime where you have a built-in web browser. It's not a web project anymore. It's an app. So what we had done was... Um, let me just get back to that. That was Cordova uh, Run Browser. If you were paying attention to what that was doing behind the scenes, it was saying a bunch of stuff about cleaning, etc. And then it says here, You've got, uh, we're running this command, a batch file is running behind the scenes, and technically we're running off of a special web server, localhost port 8000, and it's running the index file <coughs> and the CSS and the JavaScript and, and the logo and such, and then it gets stuck right there. I'll get back to that in a moment. But uh, we have to now get used to running it in via Cordova, not Notepad. Let's say we wanted to change a few things. I see in the index file a bunch of lines, which I'll explain. But if you go all the way down to lines 42 and 43, that looks familiar. Device is ready. Connecting to device. It's HTML. I want to change it for fun to say, please wait, and then ready to rock. That's HTML. We have experience in that. There's a P tag 
with a class, actually two classes, and some text that appears, please wait, and then a class on, the, on another paragraph, a different class, ready to rock. If I were to run this from Notepad in Firefox or Chrome, it wouldn't fully uh, it wouldn't fully work yet because it's going to it's going to get stuck on on the please wait part. Something is not allowing it to trigger to get past that point to display the ready to rock. To fully test it, let's go back to your command prompt. It's still on the last command. It's not, it's not on the command prompt to accept a new command. It doesn't say C drive, etc. It's still running your current version. I made changes, but those changes do not update automatically. This, is, uh, this one is still the version where I first did that run browser. You saw that I saved it, but it still didn't change. It still says connected to the device. We need to recompile. So when we make changes to any bit of our web project, we need to save it and recompile. We're not going to do run anymore from Notepad. We're going to be in the command prompt, and I need to get its attention. It's still running the old version. On the keyboard, press Control c Terminate batch job. Just press Control c one more time instead of pressing yes. I think that's faster. Control c twice. Instead of Control c y enter, Control c twice. Terminate the batch job, which was running, which compiled it, was running the virtual device. So you terminated it. Control c twice. On the Mac, you're going to do Command c. I think maybe Control c. Now we're back at the command prompt. I want to run that in the browser again. What was that command again? Too much typing. Press up on the keyboard and that'll bring back your last commands. So you might have to scroll back a little bit. But pressing up on the keyboard brings back your final commands. Run browser. Run it again. I've got a new version of the code. I've changed some of that HTML. I need to run it again. Ready to rock. So the version um, over here was before. So the version here was before I made those changes, uh, and then it didn't. Um, update automatically. And here I did Cordova run browser. It did, it did the compiling and the deployment and all of that, and now it's on the, dev the virtual device again, the browser, with my new code, my new result. That's going to be our new workflow. Editing code in Notepad or Sublime or Brackets, whatever, but we still need to run the actual compilation commands in the command prompt. We go back to our index file. Doc type HTML5. It's an HTML5 compliant document. <coughs> there is a license agreement here. You can read that on your own if you'd like. At some time, I'm going to collapse it. If you click the little symbol next to it, it's a comment. It's it's collapsed. Great. Then the HTML actually starts on line 20. There's a head. There's another comment block. I'll be back to this one in a moment meta content security policy. This is a meta tag we haven't talked about yet. I'll detail it in a moment. Meta tag for format detection, telephone no. Um, there's different ways to create these mobile projects and this telephone standard. We're saying no. Uh, we're using a, a Cordova standard basically. So this is it's just there, it's how it is, it's basic, don't worry about it. MS application tab highlight content, no. If you're running this project on a Microsoft device, MS application, a Microsoft device, 
you can tap and hold to select the text and maybe do cut and paste. Well, that works great for a website, but it's not a website anymore, it's an app. You usually don't press and hold on the Instagram logo and copy its text. So here we're disabling that ability if your project is running on a Microsoft device. Here's one thing we might recognize, the viewport. User scalable, no. Initial scale, one. Maximum scale, one. We've seen those. What does user scalable, no do? No longer able to zoom in and zoom out. What does initial scale, one do? The viewport is automatically at 100% zoom. Maximum scale, maximum zoom is 100. Here's a couple of different ones. Minimum scale. Um, so the minimum zoom, this, these are just covering the bases. Actually, we didn't see maximum before. We saw width. Width equals device width. So it stretches out the project. These are two new ones to be even more mobile-esque. Maximum zoom, minimum zoom, 100. Initial zoom, 100. Zoom in or out? No. And also stretch the project to fit the device with tablet, virtual device, landscape, web browser. We've got a connection to a CSS file, which we'll look at in a moment. We've got a title. Well, this is worthless because in an app there is no title. Tab. We're not in the browser anymore. We're in, a, we're in an app. There's no tab. So that can be anything. It never really shows up. But to be compliant, we've got a title. Head ends, body starts. Div. We've got a div, which is a generic container with a class, which must mean there's either some JavaScript or some CSS controlling it. The reason we use classes and IDs, as we've seen, is to control an HTML element, either via CSS or JavaScript. That's a class of app, h1 Apache Cordova. We do see that in the browser, the text Apache Cordova. Maybe if I change that, it might change in the project. It will. Then we've got another div. This one's got a unique ID, device ready, class blink. These are defined elsewhere. <coughs> we'll see a paragraph of please wait a paragraph of Ready to Rock. You saw that if you run it simply as a website, it never gets past please wait, because the event of received never happens. The device never becomes ready, because we're not running it in a device with run Chrome. There's something going on behind the scenes, which we'll see, that when we do Cordova run Android, Cordova run iOS, Cordova emulate Windows Phone. There's something that causes a device ready, which then triggers the ready to rock. The div ends, a couple of JavaScript libraries. The Cordova JS library, hundreds of lines of code that does all the magic of converting our JavaScript, HTML, and CSS into Swift and or Objective-C and C-sharp and Java and whatever other languages the other platforms use. We never have to look inside that Cordova file. We can if we want to, but it's just gibberish because it's all really advanced code from the Cordova team that converts all of this easy-to-understand web languages into the harder native languages. And then we've got a reference over to another index file in a folder. Then the project ends, less than 50 lines. Most of it is from that, most of it is from this uh, comment of the license. We'll come back to this other commented part in a moment. It's kind of complex, but we'll come back to it. Any questions on this HTML file? It's just HTML. If you look back in the folder, let's look in the CSS folder. One file of CSS. 
don't double click it, you want to right click, edit with notepad. This one is 116 lines of CSS code with a contract or not a contract, a license at the top. I'm going to collapse that. And then it goes on to various uh, CSS rules. We've got the universal selector. Apply the following to everything. WebKit, tap, highlight color. Make transparent link selection. Adjust last value opacity 0 to 1. Uh, so this is related to also to not break the illusion that we're not a website anymore. We're a real app. When a person taps to hold to highlight, make that highlight invisible. Zero, 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 zero. Make the color invisible. It doesn't actually highlight to break the illusion. The body, various other things, touch, call out, none. Prevent call out to copy image, etc. when tap to hold. Again, you don't get that in the Facebook app. You cannot tap and hold you know, a person's icon to copy their picture and paste it into some other app. We can program that to do that in various conditions, but the default is we don't want it to behave like a plain old website. We want it to behave like an app. There's a few ways that we deactivate these web behaviors. They're default, they're built in, we should keep them. Background color definitions. A plain old gray color, a nicer versions of gradients. That's what I'm seeing here. It's not just plain gray, it, it goes from a grayish to a different gray to another gray. So here's a spot where we can define the background color in several different ways to try to cover all the different kinds of devices. One device might cover, might, might understand the code a certain way, a different device another way. Background attachment fixed. Font family. We've seen that. Here's setting our font styles. Helvetica New Light, Helvetica New, Helvetica Arial, Sans Serif. Whatever we learned about the uh, changing our fonts will apply here too. We'll do that later. Font sizes, they did pixels, 12, height, height of the body, stretch it to 100% tall so that the gradient goes all the way down. No margin, no padding. Text transform, make all the text at the moment uppercase and the width of the body 100%. So it, again, fully uh, stretches to the size of the device. <coughs> Portrait layout, default landscape layout. So there's a couple of CSS rules. And there's a media query. We saw the media query for the sizes uh, on different devices. And here's another way to also detect if the device goes landscape. Any media that has a screen and its aspect ratio is at least a square, one to one, and its minimum width is 400. That's basically saying if we detect that we go to landscape, do the following. The default is background URL logo. There's that Cordova mascot graphic. No repeat, centered at the top. Where is it positioned? How much from the left, from the top, the height of the picture, the width of the picture? any text align into the center, some padding margin. So that's how we're getting the positioning of the picture, whether it's uh, landscape or portrait. If it's portrait, it'll do that. The text is centered, text align centered. And then if it's landscape, well now put that picture to the left instead of it being uh, centered and change your paddings a little bit so that the text is next to it like that plain old h1 definition we can tweak those sizes of the fonts etc that's nothing special here's the special parts event dot event 
dot event dot listening. These are classes. These are invented, um, and it's defining border radius. What does border radius do again? Yeah. Rounded corners. It's giving rounded corners of four pixels to something. Text color white. Font size. Then we've got event listening and event received. This makes sense if you look back on the HTML. We have something of a class of event and also with the class of listening or the class of received. Something of a class of event, listening, and received. So the please wait is first defined right here. Background color of a gray. And you saw that, that when we're testing it on a non-device, it's gray, it's rounded, text is white. And after the event is received, after we properly run the project, like a real device, the color of that little box changes to green. Um, some other stuff happens elsewhere. So that these display. These will hide and display. It's switching the two. First on listening and then on received. There's a little fade animation programmed in here. From fully visible to 40% visible, back and forth. The animation also then is a fade animation taking 3,000 milliseconds or 3 seconds, loops forever. That's causing that glow when I'm running it on a real device. Right there. When I'm running it, on, uh, running it on a real device, it's glowing back and forth, that green color. Transparency. Those are things that we can edit. Uh, if you want to change sizes or whatever, that's conceptually not that hard to do. Let's go look at the other items in the project. We'll back up. Image folder, IMG. Simply the Cordova mascot graphic. Nothing special. We can edit it in Photoshop or Fireworks or whatever if we want, or substitute our own. We'll see how later, of course. Back up and go to your JavaScript folder. index.js. Let's <coughs> edit that. This one's 46 lines. There's the license. Collapse that. var app equals. This is pretty complex. It's in constructor notation. What does that mean? We'll get to it. But here we're defining a command app. Eventually, at the bottom, we run app.initialize. We initialize the actual project. Initialize is defined up there. Initialize is a function. The syntax here is a little bit different than what we started to look at in part one. It has to be because of the complexity. But here, our project. Um, has a command, basically a method, initialize, a method of on device ready, and a method of received event. The app launches, it tries to initialize, which is up here, document dot add event listener. This is very similar to when we had document dot get element by ID button dot on click. We had some event handler. We had something, we had a way to wait for an event, a button click. This is a different way to do it. We're waiting for an event. Device ready. Once the project is loaded in a real device, the real device will emit the event device ready. That's similar to when we have a button, we press the button, it emits the on-click event, and something happens. The device is going to emit device ready. 
once we catch that, we're listening for it, we're waiting for it, once that happens, comma, then run on device ready method uh, with other syntax we'll talk about. If device ready happened, the device is ready to start actually running, so the on device ready or the project is actually ready to start running. So on device ready function is triggered, uh, received event, which then takes us further down here. We did receive the event of device ready continue initialization. Received event then does some other things. Document dot get element by ID. ID, which is device ready. Store that temporarily. Create another variable, listening element. Parent element dot query selector listening and received. Basically, look at the HTML code, make sure these things exist, so that then the please wait element CSS display none. Hide the please wait. And then the ready to rock display lock. We did something very, very similar to that the long way. Document dot get element by ID um, div show dot style dot display equals none. And here is a more modern way, set attribute of style display none. Console log, quoted text, received event from your element. And that's what's happening here. Received event, device ready, line 42. Line 42. So this app does nothing. Actually, it does everything. It gets us ready to do anything we want with a bunch of stuff that happens. And some of it is kind of like a black box. You don't quite need to know exactly how everything works. And most of the time, all of the code that we're going to write is going to be inside of this received event function. All that other stuff is just basic to set ourselves up to be cross-platform and to work on every device and our own custom JavaScript code basically will go in here. Let's try it right now. Let's say on line 43, alert, hello world. Show yourself that, which means you go back to the console, you run Cordova run browser, or Cordova emulate Android. We'll do Cordova run browser. That's one of the faster ways to do it. I made a change to my CSS. Add it on line 43. Make sure you're still inside of the received event. Back to the command prompt. It's waiting for, it's waiting for me. It's running my current version. How do I get out of this to grab its attention? Control C twice. Press up on the keyboard, hopefully, to bring back your last command if you didn't. If it's not there, you'll have to type it manually. Code over run browser. Enter. Right. Wait for that to compile. It should do it much faster than before because it's not much to, to change. And then a pop up. Hello world. Because I've got mine already set up, uh, I'm going to show this off. I'm going to do. Don't try this because it's you're not set up yet. Cordova run Android device, and it's going to run on this real device. It's going to pop up here in a moment on a real device. Pops up, pop up there. Elvira, can you confirm that that says "Hello World"? Yes. So it popped up in the browser. It popped up on a real device. Now it looks nicer on the real device. It looks like a real pop-up as part of the operating system, where here it looks like a plain old JavaScript pop-up. Localhost says whatever. Here it looks like a real kind of a pop-up with a real OK button. 
And we would do something very similar to that to get it on an iOS device, on a Windows device, on a Blackberry, on a Kindle, any device, basically. And that's Cordova. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Cordova does the magic, and it comes on a device. So all of these things here that we're seeing, this is where we're going to spend most of our time, editing the, the HTML or the CSS or the JavaScript. We still need to understand a few different things. We'll get to that. We're going to mostly continue to write the languages that we know. Any questions so far? So we'll still be writing the notepad. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then copy and drop into Cordova. We will just do it. We'll just do it directly. Uh, we will see about transferring an existing project into this skeleton. But basically, we're going to continue to write our code in a folder of a Cordova project, and then we will do the Cordova run or the Cordova emulate commands. Mm -hmm. It's not going to what? It's like exploring with jQuery. Yes, we're still going to use jQuery. This particular project doesn't have the jQuery library, but we will add it so that we can use jQuery. We definitely want to use jQuery as it's going to let us write code in a better way. We'll need to set that up in a bit. Um, can we also always be putting it just on the desktop, or are there some folder locations typically that you would be? Right now, I've got it. We're going to explore the folder structure in a moment, actually. But our whole project, good point here, our whole project right now is that. If I left it on the desktop and I didn't save it to a flash drive, I'm going to lose it. And right now, the project's not that big. It's. Uh, well, now it's jumped up to 16 megabytes. It was 5 a moment ago. But now as I start to work on it, it gets a little larger, and every time you add a new platform, it gets a little larger. That's necessary. But um, we created this on the desktop. We would then need to either simply drag and drop it to our flash drive, or in the command prompt itself, we could go into our flash drive and create the project in the flash drive because we want to take it with us. And I'll put it, I'll be putting a copy of my version of the project in the folder, network folder, at the end of the day if you want a copy. But yes, you'll need to take that project with you back and forth and work on it from your flash drive to keep it safe. As for the folder structure, let's explore that a little bit more. We were inside of this WW folder. We'll spend most of our time here. And let's back up. We have hooks, platforms, plugins. You don't really do very much at all under hooks. You can look in there. There's a README file. Just don't worry about the hooks folder. Platforms. Uh, we'll look at platforms in a moment. Let's look at plugins. Plugins is the folder where we will be able to add the features of the device. Right now, our our project does not know how to access the camera. We would need to add a plugin so that we write some JavaScript and then Cordova converts that code to the right camera code for the Android, for the iOS, for the Windows platforms. So for fun you can do this. Back to command prompt. Cordova uh, plugin add Cordova dot dash plugin dash camera. This is going to unlock the ability for us to write some JavaScript, which will then get translated to the appropriate platform code. It's not on by default, because the project would be even larger. 
There's a bunch of plugins to choose from. We'll look them up in a moment. But we can have a plugin to access the Bluetooth of a device. We have a plugin to access the GPS. Uh, this one is a plugin to access the camera. It doesn't matter what device, but in the moment, at the moment, the Android camera. And it connects back to the Cordova mothership, basically finds the code, brings it in, adds it, compiles it, and now we have Cordova plugin list. I've got the camera installed. I've got a compatibility plugin installed and the whitelist. We those are there automatically. And in the folder, Cordova plugin camera, Cordova plugin compat, and Cordova plugin whitelist. So this project now has the ability for us to start to access the camera. Cordova plugin add, and then the name of the of the plugin. There's about uh, nine official plugins from Cordova to do common tasks, and then because all of this is open source, people invent more plugins, oftentimes for free, to do even more things, like a QR code scanner. I want my app to be able to scan barcodes to do something with them. There's, there's no official Cordova QR scanner, but there's many developers out there that have put them out, and then you'll be able to install it on your app and start scanning barcodes to make an app that does that. Uh, this has the ability to use the camera, but to actually use the camera, we have to write a bunch of JavaScript and HTML and, and display your pictures in CSS and all of that. But I'm just showing that your plugins folder is the folder where all your uh, plugins get installed. Um, if I no longer wanted the camera plugin for whatever reason, I would not delete it from the folder. I would do the opposite here. Cordova, you don't have to do this, but Cordova, plugin remove. Cordova dash plugin dash camera. Now, obviously, it seems so easy that I can type all of these commands and I got it memorized. And yeah, I do. And there's not that many to memorize. And if we're used to pressing a button to run and a file export and all of that, this is a big difference. But you're seeing we're typing the name of the software over and over, some command, and then perhaps some extra attributes or properties of the command. That would have been like inside of Eclipse, you know, uh, project, uh, plugins, remove, check mark on the camera, click OK, and it does it. Here it's just, I know the command, I type it, and it does it. And it removed the, in my case, it removed the camera feature from, from, the, um, from the Android operating system and from the browser. If I had iOS installed, it would do that too. And now my folder here in Windows, those are gone. I would not simply delete them because there's also other uh, internal files that need to change, not just deleting a folder. Did you say Uh, I, uh, the whitelist, I believe, uh, is related to what are appropriate files that can be opened, so it should not be affected by the camera. It, well, it left the whitelist alone. Say that again? Does it remove from doing the new um, command, put over the camera, remove the directory? It does. A moment ago, I had the camera. And I left the whitelist. I didn't remove that. I removed the camera. If we go back to the Explorer here, back to test one, now we'll look at platforms. 
the operating system code is going to be in its own folder here. Browser is only 2.47 megabytes or so. Android is 5.59 inside of the browser folder. We're not going to spend too much time in these folders, you really shouldn't, but just to kind of look inside, here's a bunch of ancillary things. Here's a copy of the WW folder where it'll be there. Oh, there's our Cordova.js file. That Cordova.js file doesn't actually exist in the main WW folder. If it's not there, don't worry about it. It will be added at runtime, at the time that it compiles, but you could see it under platforms and browser, under the WW folder, there's Cordova.js. It is 57 kilobytes of uncompressed, of compressed code. I guess uncompressed. Well, it goes was, it was on to 1,863 lines of Cordova code that you don't need to really know how it works, it just works. But if we need to do a console.alert, somewhere there it explains what does that mean in the Android operating system, what does that mean in the Windows operating system, etc. So really complex stuff going in here that you never have to really look inside of. But this is what makes the magic happen per platform. There's stuff there. There's a copy of my project. And okay, interesting. If I go back up to the top, back to the Android folder, again, I see copies of my projects. So all of these. Um, All of these items, all of these platforms have their own folders and such, and just a bunch of things you don't really need to look at. It's all of these things in here. Um, one interesting thing uh, that you can look at is inside of this res folder, um, we then have some of the icons that apply to the uh, to the Android specific platform, a, a um, you know the landscape splash screen and other things, but don't worry about it at the moment. We're going to define the icons for our projects so that they we define our icon and then the icon will compile to all of the platforms. So basically, we're only going to spend time in this WW folder. And this very important file here. Let's back up to the root level of the project. And let's open this XML file. Right click, edit in Notepad. This is XML, which is related to HTML in that it uses tags. But the whole idea of XML is that these tags are invented as necessary, basically. HTML has the head tag, which has a meaning. It has the P tag, which has a meaning. In XML, we can basically invent our own tags, such as a description tag, it has a pair, an author tag, a name tag. Well, we can invent any tags in HTML and XML, but then something processes them. It's not that we can invent a tag here called my icon and it'll do anything. It won't. Because this is further defined as a Cordova project. So these tags make sense in a Cordova project. They don't make sense if you open them in, in in Chrome or Firefox. It doesn't know what to do with them. It only understands HTML. These tags then are reserved for apps. So XML version 1, etc. Widget tag. This is our project, Cordova version 1, etc. Name, Hello Cordova. That's the name of the icon 
that appears uh, below. Uh, that's the text that appears below the icon. When you were exploring this inside of your emulator, there was a, an app called Hello Cordova. We can change that right here. Let's try this, line three. We'll say, my amazing app. That's the text, that's the name of our app. I'm going to save it, and then I need to go back to the command prompt. You will only see this on a real device or virtual device, Cordova, emulate, Android. It won't work in the browser. There's no place for the browser to show an app icon. So I want to run this on an emulator or if I have it set up on a real device. We don't have that set up yet, so we'll run it on an emulator. Mine's going to crash, so I won't run it. You try it. Run it on your emulator. Cordova Emulate Android. Wait for a moment to pop up in your device. Click the Home button to go back to the home screen of your virtual device and then go to your app screen and you will see an app called My Amazing App as well as Cordova Hello Cordova. I'll explain why later. But this name is the is the icon that appears below is the text that appears below the icon of your app. So simply changing that changes in your in your device. There's a description here, a sample Apache Cordova app that responds to the device ready event. That can be changed later on to say my barcode reader app and that might show up in the description of the app itself or on the App Store. You should be able to click to do the OK button with the mouse. It, it, it might be crashing, unfortunately. Yeah, try to press the home button for a moment. So this file is full of very basic aspects of your app. How to change the text below the icon, author information, and so forth. Uh, question, Hank? The emulator does not appear yet? Yeah, it just might be slow. That's why we don't want to close our emulator, because it might take a moment. But sometimes we have to close it if it crashes. Yeah. So, uh, say the camera, the camera is not Plug in. On the, on the emulator, all of these icons are already populated. The so feature. The feature of the camera is already installed on the emulator, yes. The emulator itself can take photos. But what we're doing with Cordova Plugin Add Camera is for our app.
to be able to access the camera of the device. Yes, Joe. The, um, after you run, uh, after you emulate, you then uh, click the home button, the circle, I can't show it because my emulator is not working, but click the circle icon of your emulator and go to your apps, the screen where all your apps are installed. And you will see a new app called My Amazing App with an icon. So this shows content source index HTML. The starting point, the first screen that shows up in my app is the index HTML. So in theory, if I make a new index file, don't do this, but if I were to make a new file called start.html, if I have the Marvel blog and I drop it in here, marvel.html. That was a self-contained project, pretty much. And if I drop it in here, my code here is saying the starting screen of this app is index.html. If I had marvel.html, that's what would start up. It would ignore the index file and this would start up. It's often a lot easier in keeping this as index and you know, rewriting your index to actually be your project. But just kind of thinking about it conceptually, that's what that line is saying there. The starting screen is a screen called index.html. The whitelist plugin is installed by default to um, to allow certain features. Now, um, I don't believe we can add comments to this, so don't add comments. Uh, this is not defined to accept comments, so it would be nice to add comments to everything that I'm saying, but uh, I don't believe we can add comments to this. Yes? No, I wouldn't do that because also what you need to do there are other files inside of the plugins folder there's a whitelist folder and inside of here there's a bunch of things so simply calling it here is halfway that's why we definitely do Cordova plugin <coughs> add camera it will add itself to the XML file the config file and it will add itself to the folder here and set itself all up properly Uh, access origin, we are able to open just about any kind of file in our project, and we are able to access external files out on the internet. This, th These things here that are by default here are very good to leave alone because they are the most basic skeleton of a project. We can add to it, and once we further read the documentation, we may figure out how to change what exists. But whatever is here is very good to leave alone. Let our project, our app, access websites, normal or secure. Let our project be able to dial phone numbers. If we have a link in the HTML file, um, href equals tell colon slash slash 619-522-1212, it could actually dial a phone number in your app because we have the tell protocol. We have the SMS protocol. What's that? Texts. Text messaging. In theory, we could text from our app href equals SMS colon and then a phone, num phone number. We can send an email from our app. We can access geolocation features, GPS. <coughs> These are universal for every platform. Then we have platform-specific code. We have the platform tag with the name attribute, Android. Anything in these two tags will only affect or apply 
in an Android device. Market. Being able to open up the Android market, nowadays known as Google Play. We can open up a link from Google Play in our app, like to recommend people, why don't you download our other app? And it'll take them directly to Google Play App Store. <coughs> If we were running this on an iOS device, we would be able to, again, also look at <coughs> iTunes or the iTunes apps, guide people directly to our other apps in the iOS app stores. So things that we would often change here, of course, would be the name of our of our app, the description, the author, and notice this one's an email address, a website, and the name of the developers. And these other ones that are here by default, these are recommended to leave alone. So that's looking at this config XML file. It's one of the things that controls our project in the most basic way. These are the two things we'll mostly be editing, the WW folder the config XML file and everything else we don't quite need to get in there just works on its own any questions so far so the description review is explain about the application on the Android app or just on our um, HTML code on it depends. This explanation, this description is an explanation of your project, yes, and it may be used by the app stores. Uh, so it's a good idea to fill it in properly to explain what this app is, because it's going to possibly be used by the app stores. So in this class, the description only is able to read once, like on the app store, right? Like the description, not once you download it. No, it's not that visible by the average user. It's usually shown more on the app stores. So uh, it has a purpose, but it's not that used that much. You know, I download, uh, I download Snapchat, and I read the description one yeah, time, and I'm never going to read it again. I just use it. Yeah, that's the description. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, you know, like some app, you can see some photo or some uh, video footage about how to use it. Mm -hmm. Is it added in this section, or is another section that we should No, we'll be, we'll be covering that in part three of the class, because eventually when this project is done, we want to upload it to app stores. We want to put it on Google Play, Amazon App Store, Google, uh, iTunes Store. There is where we create our, our app listing, and there is where we have the... The, the long description, the video on how to use it, our reviews, and all of that. But that's all in part three of the class. Maybe it's like, my question is about, like, uh, maybe it's not it, I don't know, but just pass it down on that. Like, if you want to develop some apps that are able to store some data, is it going to our needs as well, or not part of our needs? We are going to store data, but we're going to store data locally in the app. If we wanted to store data in the cloud, we would need a cloud infrastructure. We would need some sort of LAMP stack, Amazon, uh, Amazon server, a GoDaddy server. We would need some server to be able to store our data in the cloud. Uh, we might not get that far, but we will be storing data in our app it itself. And then uh, we will be setting it up to be able to then replicate onto a server, but a server oftentimes really is not free. And especially if your app gets popular and it gets a lot of traffic in your server, that's usually not free. Uh, so we'll touch on it, but uh, I'll guide us where you can further go. But we will definitely be able to store app in our app, uh, store data in our app. No, but that's good questions because this is a big this is a big can of worms and they're all wiggling all over the place and we want to know everything that's going on. We're going to get to that. It's a lot to get to and I've got handouts and all of that that'll make more of it sense. But right now I wanted to just dive into it and see. Look at what we've got. We've got a lot to learn still. But we've got a whole month. That's why this whole class focuses a big deal on that. That's the name of the class. The whatever it's called again. The uh, 
develop a platform, whatever the class is called. It's this whole thing about what do we need to set up to make apps now that we have some experience in the visuals and functionality of it. Uh, let's uh, take one more break and then when we come back let's start to look at some of the some of the documentation and how to do this at home. You probably want to do this at home right away. So we'll start to look at that right after the break. It's 8.37. We'll be back at 8.47 and we'll look at the documentation and go on.